Kurt Gödel was a German-Austrian mathematician slash philosopher who was a colleague of Einstein at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. In his studies, Gödel focused on a branch of mathematics called logic. The field of mathematical logic, or just logic as it is also known, is the study of the elements and relationships that make up mathematics itself. To get a better idea of what logic is, think of the letters of the alphabet and how they can come together to form words, and then words come together to form sentences, and so forth. In other words, logic is a fundamental branch of mathematics since it essentially defines the most basic elements of math itself. Gödel worked in this space called logic. In 1931, Gödel would publish what is known today as his incompleteness theorem. It has a catchy name, but its implications are beyond catchy. Some would even say that the theorem's conclusions are of the religious nature. First of all, the formal title of Gödel's article that contained his incompleteness theorem was on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems. The article and the theorem itself spans multiple pages. However, the introduction to the article establishes the basic tenets for the incompleteness theorem. Reduced to a few axioms and rules of inference, it may therefore be surmised that these axioms and rules of inference are also sufficient to decide all mathematical questions which can in any way at all be expressed formally in the systems concerned. It is shown below that this is not the case, and that in both the systems mentioned here are in fact relatively simple problems in the theory of ordinary whole numbers, which cannot be decided from the axioms. This situation is not due in some way to the special nature of the system set up, but holds for a very extensive class of formal systems including, in particular, all those arising from the addition of a finite number of axioms to the two systems mentioned, provided that thereby no false propositions of the kind described become provable. That's a lot to digest. What Gödel was basically stating in this introduction was that all mathematical axioms or rules can be derived from a manipulation of basic mathematical principles that are themselves based on elementary numbers. But he was declaring that there are some mathematical expressions that cannot be derived from these basic pillars of math. Therefore, this meant that the most basic tenets of mathematics, the most basic pieces, like the set of natural numbers, or the set of integers within rudimentary arithmetic functions, such as addition or subtraction or division, all of these might be built upon an unstable foundation, so to speak. But we know that these simplistic mathematical functions have held their own through the test of time and have allowed humanity to accomplish such feats as calculate planetary orbits, peer into the quantum realm, and even sum the number of nucleic acid sequences within the human genome. So Gödel postulated then that the true contradiction or paradox was in the fact that you could not prove that an elementary mathematical element was an element at all by self-referencing. In other words, you cannot prove that a number is a number simply by saying that it is included in a group of numbers. That's a tongue twister with further implications. For example, if you cannot prove that a number is a number by self-referencing it, then the same would apply to any logical statement outside of mathematics. In other words, you can't say something is inside a box if it is outside the box and vice versa. The only way to prove that a primary element exists without the need for an equal or opposite primary element is for an outside observer, i.e. a third party, that exists outside of the set of elements that contain both the primary and the opposite primary elements. Gödel never actually stated that he believed that this outside observer fit the concept of an omniscient god, but it is implied. After all, Gödel's incompleteness theorem was not originally meant to apply to situations outside of mathematical logic. But in fact, Gödel, 10 years later, after shocking the scientific world with the propositions within his incompleteness theorem, secretly began developing an ontological proof for the existence of God. And I say secretly because his proof for God's existence would not be made public until after he died. 
This due to the fact that he felt, sadly, that he would be ostracized by the mathematical community if it was determined that he really did believe in God by proving that God existed, albeit mathematically. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines an ontological argument as follows. Ontological arguments are arguments for the conclusion that God exists, from premises which are supposed to derive from some source other than the observation of the world, for example, from reason alone. In other words, ontological arguments are arguments from what are typically alleged to be none but analytic, a priori, and necessary premises to the conclusion that God exists. So in fact, Gödel's ontological argument for God's existence was one that was based on reason and logic, something that he obviously was a master at. This is what the refined, mathematically notated version of Gödel's ontological proof of God's existence looks like. It consists of 12 logical expressions. Within these expressions, there are five axioms, four theorems, and lastly, three definitions. The symbols within the proof are called logical operators, and they serve to compare two or more elements within the proof. Without getting overtly technical, the names of some of these operators are This one means for all, meaning for all elements that satisfy some condition. This one is just shorthand for the words there exists. Finally, this one refers to what you could call a property or function related to something Godel labels as positivity. This property of positivity is the key to understanding Godel's argument. Godel's novel but complicated proof, which itself expanded upon mathematically on the ontological argument put forth by St. Anselm of Canterbury in the year 1077, could be described in the following way via four statements written in common English. 1. Something is considered to be godlike if and only if it contains all exclusively consistent, positive characteristics. 2. The concept of God must be something that fits the definition of being godlike, based on number 1. Therefore, this concept of God must be something that cannot have negative characteristics. 3. In order for something like God to be composed of entirely positive characteristics, that something must exist. In other words, it cannot be a figment of our imagination, since existing is also a positive characteristic. And 4. Therefore, if that something that acts like God, i.e. is godlike, exists, then that something must be God. And so, we can conclude that God exists. Although Gödel's proof, like that of St. Anselm, appears to be a mere intellectual thought exercise, Gödel was able to apply mathematic rigor in supporting each statement in his ontological proof. Unfortunately, Gödel, as many of the great mathematicians and thinkers throughout the centuries, suffered deeply from periods of mental instability and illness. Due to the death of a close friend in 1936, when Gödel was 30 years old, from that point forward, Gödel would develop an obsessive fear of being poisoned, and so he would only eat foods that his wife Adele Gödel would cook for him. This continued for the next 40 years, until unfortunately, late in 1977, Adele was hospitalized and so became unable to cook for Gödel. Since Adele could not cook for him, Gödel refused to eat. Very sadly, he died of self-imposed starvation on January 14, 1978. He and Adele are both buried in Princeton, New Jersey. As mentioned, Gödel, during his life, never publicly declared his belief in God. But after his death, an analysis of his works and sayings in regards to the topic of God have resulted in an interesting perspective. This collection of sayings on the topic are primarily due to the relationship that Gödel had with his good friend, Hao Wang, another mathematician slash logician who became Gödel's confidant on controversial topics. The following are quotes from Gödel that Wang includes in his own writings. In regards to rationality, Gödel would state, The world is rational, according to which the order of the world reflects the order of the supreme mind governing it. 
In regards to what kind of God Goro believed in, Goro would state, Einstein's religion was more abstract, like Spinoza and Indian philosophy. Spinoza's God is less than a person. Mine is more than a person, because God can play the role of a person. In regards to the concept of faith, Goro would state, If we define faith as a belief based on the authority of the information source, be it scripture, scientists, a friend, a teacher, a digital picture, a DNA test, our own cognition and experiences, or even politicians for the really insane, we will realize that faith plays an essential role in the development or destruction of knowledge. Why is it acceptable in science and mathematics to have faith, not only in the axioms or laws of nature, but also in the peer review process and the causality principle, while faith in the religious realm is viewed as superstitious at best? Faith and reason, reason and faith. Profound words from a profound thinker. To end today's episode, I leave you with Pascal's Wager, a famous thought experiment conceived by 17th century French philosopher slash scientist, Blaise Pascal. God is or he is not. Let us weigh the gain and loss in selecting God is. If you win, you win it all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Therefore, bet unhesitatingly that he is. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like this video and consider subscribing and signing up for notifications to be notified whenever new content is released by the Paranormal Nothing Podcast. And, as always, question everything.